This is Dr. David Proden, and I want to thank you as we begin another journey into school and community safety. If you're looking for industrial safety expert, Appalachian State University professor, Dr. Timothy Ludwig, please visit www.safety-doc.com. Again, that's Dr. Timothy Ludwig at www.safety-doc.com. Welcome to the Safety Doc Podcast with author, radio host, and nationally recognized safety expert, Dr. David Perodin. Join us each week as we discuss the best and most bizarre practices in safety preparation and crisis response. Follow Dr. Perodin on Twitter at SafetyPhD. And remember, the truth will keep you safe. Hi, everybody. This is David, and welcome to the Safety Doc Podcast. So, it's been a while since you've heard from me. I uh, was under the weather for a few weeks and glad to be back. Thank you for the emails uh, checking in and asking, hey, when will we have another show, um, especially with Hurricane Florence and the hurricane special I did last year with Katie Pichon of Cajun Navy Relief. A number of you were wondering if I could come in and do a, a podcast about the hurricane. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to do that, but a number of you did go back and access the interview that I did with Katie, and I see some people just went online and, and retweeted that. So um, many of the similar principles applied. I think actually with the the hurricane on the East Coast, it's more of an issue of sustained flooding. Um, the drainage isn't going to be as fast as what happened for Hurricanes Irma and Harvey. So it'll be that issue, I think, that we keep our focus on over the next few weeks and what that also means for the Centers in Dis for Disease Control, for uh, mosquito management and mold and things like that. I think those will be more substantial issues than the hurricanes um, that we talked about last year, which would have been Hurricane Irma and Harvey. So today uh, we will talk about the Tenth Amendment and what it means, and how the 10th Amendment empowers citizen rescue forces across the United States. This is an area that I researched as part of my book, Lessons of Lower Manhattan, because one of the questions that comes up um, once you, you look at these massive rescue forces, and even more, not on a macro level, but on a micro level, which happen locally, and I'm going to talk about that. But it's like, why do these forces exist? And more of the question is, why do they exist? Uh, because like, what's not prohibiting them or regulating them out of existence? Because certainly there's a lot of liability with taking Cajun Navy, Navy relief um, and civilians pulling boats and taking those boats to rescue people. What happened if you hit a you know, down power line or boat overturns, where does responsibility, liability lie for that? Um, and not that that should interfere with those activities happening, but I think with how we've evolved as a society and how lawsuits have become so prevalent, um, the question that comes up often is why would people take on this risk knowing that they could be sued in the attempt of, of a rescue? And I think there's a very distinct reason um, b behind wanting to act in the best interest of other people, which is really the genuine core reason. But there's also a reason within the Tenth Amendment that digs down into why that's that's possible. So I want to I want to talk about that today. So a few things. <laughs> I lost two pairs of shoes. Well, I lost a pair of sandals and a pair of shoes all in the same week after doing a podcast, the last podcast with John Steele and mentioning how I had polished up my dress shoes and how once I got a pair of shoes, they pretty much were going to last, you know, 20, 30 years. And at this point in my life, I start to say things like, this will be the last lawnmower I will buy, or this will be the last pair of shoes or the last winter coat. And I think I do have my last winter coat, my 
um, navy pea coat, which has been around forever. And as long as you get it dry, clean in spring and fall, I don't think that thing has shown a nick of wear. But um, I was I <laughs> was walking and my sandals. It felt like I had small stones, you know, like little pea gravel and stuff like that, and which isn't uncommon in those sandals. And I would take them, pound them off, put them back on. A couple minutes later, same thing. I'm like, well, I'm not walking anywhere where things should be getting inside of these sandals. So what's what's the deal here? What's going on? So I took them off. And the, the bed of the sandal was just deteriorating. Um, the, the rubbery, foamy bed was just like flaking away and coming in, out in these little rubber pellets. And I flipped it over and the heel or the sole was also cracking. So I had kind of this, obviously I'm looking at this thing. There's really not much that can be done. I mean, <laughs> I had these since college. They're, I can't, I mean, even if you were to put an investment in, it wouldn't be worth it. Um, so yeah, I lost like my favorite pair of sandals and they had a clip that I don't see sandals with that anymore, a pair of Columbia sandals. So you would adjust the Velcro. And then once you have that adjusted, it had just, you know, this little plastic clip, um, kind of like you see on these, these bands, people wear these survival paracord bands where they clip same, same deal. Um, so you could clip up the shoes like really fast. And, and that was a great system, like nothing deteriorated with that over time. So my other shoes, you know, you got to go through the cinching everything up and, you know, whatever. And so it's, it takes longer and then you can never get like the same exact fit twice. <laughs> so yeah, I was sad, very sad. And then uh, I'm at work and I thought I had stepped on something and it was stuck to the bottom of my dress shoe. <laughs> so I'm swiping the shoe on the rug thinking, you know, it's a stone or something that got embedded and it's not coming off. And I'm just feeling like this greater resistance as I'm doing this. I'm like, well, what is it? What's up here? What did I, what did I step on? Um, so I, I took it and I, you know, looked at the bottom of the shoe and it had, it had split in two. <laughs> so, uh, again, took it, the pair of shoes to the shoe guy, Dan, the shoe man, and he looked at it and said, yeah, there's really nothing I can do. It wasn't the type of, of sole you could remove and replace. So again, that was a pair of shoes I had for a long time and it shined them up and everything was great. And then suddenly gone. <laughs> so in, in a matter of a week, I lost like my favorite pair of sandals and my go-to dress shoes. Um, ironically, I had a pair of, of dress shoes in reserve um, that I had worn and actually, they seem kind of better than my primary dress shoes. So I'm only looking to get so much mileage out of these things because the safety dog is right there on the cusp of retiring. And, you know, I, I only have a few ties left that I don't need these things anymore. So I just need these to, to go just a little bit more, go the distance. Um, so, yeah, sandals gave up the ghost. Dress shoes gave up the ghost. So, oh, bad, bad. So we had um, incredible amounts of, of rain over about a three-week period where I live in general proximity. Now, I live on a hill, and I have sandy soils, so I've never been affected adversely by heavy rain. Um, but parts of the town that I live in have been flooded out, and this time it was more substantial than any time I'd ever seen before as far as the amount of flooding and then the duration of flooding as far as how, that homes would be be flooded out, you, they just would become little islands and people would come in and out by, by boat or whatever. But that went on for like three weeks. And yesterday was the first day that the water actually kind of went down. Like the rain stopped and the water kept coming up for like a week to 10 days. And then it stayed there for another five, seven days. And now it's kind of come down. Um, so just, just a horrible situation because you, you have the destruction, which is occurring of these properties. And, um, then you, it becomes this kind of this, this real rancid swampy odor that goes through the, the town and, and, you know, mosquitoes. Um, and it's, it's again, it has like a pollen type feel when you're outside like you know eyes are eyes are runny nose is is itchy um and also um things are things are 
because you've had so much rain and it's hot. It's like 85 today in the middle of September. Um, things are growing. So my lawn is still growing and, and things are still blossoming out. So you used to have all of this allergy stuff, which usually by this time of year starts to go away in Wisconsin. Start to have a couple cold nights, takes care of the mosquitoes and the bugs. And then it's not too long where you'll have like one night where you'll have a freeze and then that takes care of pretty much everything else that's, you know, pollen related stuff. But I don't, we're not anywhere close to that. And when it does start to cool down, which isn't anywhere in the near forecast, you have this ambient temperature, which will just be in the soil that'll have to work its way out for, you know, a week or two. So we've, we've had interstate closures because of flooding. And the last time that happened here was uh, 10 years ago. So it's been 10 years, but yeah, interstate seals so you, for a while you're driving on one lane down the interstate and there's sandbags like on the other lane, keeping the water at bay. It was, it was, um, pretty incredible to see that. So something stuck out as I was watching some of the severe storm alerts, um, go through, and this would be when they would activate the tornado siren. Um, but the Doppler radar right now, so the the television stations can can zoom in and a lot of this is doppler indicated like this is a doppler indicated rotation which you know indicates this could be a tornado now back in the old days like you had to verify this you know and, and at night so it's very hard because you know a lot of this is a rural area but um but now it's all doppler indicated so you get a lot more tornado warnings which might not exactly be tornadoes it just might be you know the swirling in the sky that nothing touches down um so any anyway they they have it so precise they they hone in on actual city blocks like they'll say if you're at the corner of you know second and oak like right now like that is where the rotation is descending i mean it's like unbelievable i mean it's to the point where they can say kim and sandy like you right now basement uh, and you know that they can get that specific house to house and the way that they they zoom in um seems almost unreal that you have the ability to do that but yeah i mean in and of course um some of the the weather folks especially the younger ones and you can tell the ones that haven't done this that long or, or they're kind of new to an area where there's severe weather, um, they, they really get excited and, and over the top and, you know, urging everybody and this is serious. And it's like, okay, yeah, I get it. Um, but none of it actually was as far as like severe weather that serious. The rain was serious and the flooding wind exactly was very serious. But um, yeah, when I, when I grew up, we had uh, the storm chasers. So it was the TV stations would go out and they would they would chase the storms, and then they would do live updates like underneath some canopy at a gas station. They'd be like, "Here, we're with Channel, you know, seven, and and it is just unbelievable out here, and everybody should stay indoors, and this is just uh, awful, and we're going to be following the storm next." And and they got so much backlash on that because people would be like, "Well, what's the you know what's the purpose of this, except for you know." trying to get us to tune into your channel. And that kind of went away. <laughs> really do that anymore. So um, my my book, Lessons of Lower Manhattan, was due to the publisher last week and was submitted to the publisher at 12, 11 a.m. September 12th. So it was due September 11th, but it was actually 11 minutes past that deadline. It got submitted. Um, so massive undertaking um, to develop that book over the last two years, the number of interviews that went into that, um, the research on uh, understanding simulated annealing and, and different processes, and having to get permissions to use uh, material. For example, I, there was a map of lower Manhattan that was included in a 2007 presentation by the New York City Planning Committee and or Department of Planning. Um, and this map really did a terrific job of laying out the tracks of lower Manhattan and specifically indicating here's where the World Trade Center area is. Here's Battery Park where mo most of the rescue 500,000 people occurred. Um, and it was, it was more of done for a, a population and, and census type presentation, but this map exactly fit what I needed it to do for my book. Um, and it was very clean. It wasn't cluttered and it can it complete 
clear visual if you're not from New York or not familiar with New York. You could look at this and say, okay, I totally get what Dave is talking about in the book about Battery Park and how people would go to Battery Park and how you couldn't um, you couldn't go, what would it be, west um, off of Manhattan, really lower Manhattan. Like you, you could only go toward the water. Everything else was shut off. So um, I filled out, and I'm thinking this is going to be complex, right? I mean, it's, it's the city of New York <laughs> that you're dealing with. Um, and it was actually extremely uh, streamlined. So I went online and filled out the request to use this specific um, image. So I had to link out to the document that the image was in. And it, it, was, it was fairly comprehensive of why you need this image, where it's going to be published. Tell us about the publication and if you want it in a JPEG, PDF format, whatever. Um, when you need it by and, and things like that. Um, so I completed that, submitted it. About three days later, I, I get contacted back by somebody, a person in the Department of Planning in New York City. And uh, this person then asked a few clarifying comments or com- comments, clarifying questions on um, why are you re- requesting this? And okay, we understand this and, and tell us a little bit more and, and um, confirming that, you know, the actual map that I wanted because the document wasn't very long. It's like 13 or 15 pages and it had a couple different maps. And I'm like, yep, this is the one. And I'm thinking they must have, I mean, thousands of these a year. I mean, probably per department. And, you know, even like where is this saved on a hard drive somewhere like this actual image that went into this um, from 11 years ago. So they're like, okay, you know, this this makes sense. We'll uh, make a determination and get back to you within like 10 days. So it was Friday night, um, a couple nights ago. I was out Walmart shopping with the family and the phone buzzed and I looked and it was um, my contact person in New York City saying, uh, we've approved use, your use of this in the book that the publisher can use this no charge you just have to cite it in the specific way um of course can't alter the doc the image in any way and which i wouldn't do um and then also a formal legal letter which went to like eight different people in the the two line (laughs) and and then had delineated out you know my request and that the city was giving permission for this and um and I was amazed. I mean, the whole process from start to finish was less than two weeks, very smooth, and also attached in high resolution was the JPEG image of this map. So I was like, good job, New York. Um, Not what I expected just because of, again, the size of the city and having to navigate. I'm trying to imagine my contact, you know, person trying to figure out what drive is this saved on? Like, do you go back per month per presentations or is it search by title or search by, I don't know. I'm like, how, I mean, I, I don't even know how I would find something like that, you know, on my system. So it was amazing. I was so thankful. So Sunday, you know, I thank you. And that was the missing piece. I had permissions for everything else, all of my interviews, um, the other, images that I was using, this was this was the final piece. So now it goes um, into some additional edits, into readings by, um, it's not peer-reviewed because it's not a research book, but it, kind of like a peer-reviewed type process, like other readers in, through the publishing company um, go through and give feedback on the book. It's more of a formative process still at this point, although the book is done you'll have changes that they'll request you to make. Um, I'm also thinking right off the bat, like there are maybe some images that will go, that we can condense it down a little bit. It's always better to give, um, I think, a larger document and trim down from that than to give a smaller document and try to scale that up to to size. So... um, but felt great about submitting that and and the two months that went into developing that. So again, that book is about the rescue of 500,000 people from lower Manhattan on September 11th, 2001 by boat. And it was an organic rescue. 
Uh, most of the boats, so about 140 boats participated, um, about 50 were tugs. Uh, very few actually were were military um, or coast, you know, coast guard or you know, city fire police th- things like that. Um, so mo- most of this again is, is it's all you know civilian rescue, and that was a call that came out from Admiral Loy in the harbor saying, "Hey, if you've got a boat and you think you can help out, get down here." And again, why was this not a massive failure? Like you have a rescue of this size that occurs in nine hours without any directions and you have pieces that aren't really compatible. I mean, here's a, here's a, you know, luxury cruise boat and here's a tugboat and here's a fire boat. Like they're not designed to work together in a rescue force yet. They did. Um, and how the communication systems work, how people would take turns coming up, um, the makeshift kind of dock platforms that were accomplished at battery park. How then the other part of that, so that's the mechanical part. Now a lot of, Books have come out, research on that. The part that I got into deeper in my book was looking at the psychological aspect of how this worked from the 500,000 people that were rescued. Why did they effectively engage in this rescue? Um, what, what predisposed them to that? And it's something called the transference dynamic that I believe had a huge role in that. So talk about that and the psychology of... of um, why that worked, and also how it's kind of replicated itself in future, you know, since then. We saw in the Joplin tornado a strong organic kind of rescue force in 2011, Joplin, Missouri. We saw strong organic rescue force for Hurricanes Irma and Katrina in 2017. So we're we're seeing this, and I, I argue in the book, too, that we're also seeing something um, change in our social contract, the social contract theory. Thank you for tuning in to the Safety Doc Podcast with the nation's leading safety expert, Dr. David Perodin, author, radio show host, university instructor, researcher, expert witness, and consultant. Powerful testimonials. Dr. Perodin has a strong reputation as the go-to safety consultant, and he was still able to exceed our expectations. When we went looking for an expert in the field of crisis preparedness and prevention, David was the single person we pursued. Not easy stepping into the touchier subjects of life, but Dr. David pulls it off. Take a listen. Now, back to Dr. David Perodin and the Safety Doc Podcast. Social contract theory basically means that citizens agree to give up some of their rights um, in order to have a government, and they, they will abide by some of these government rights. So what that does then is it brings... Um, uh, a takes a system out of, of chaos or, or people, um, it, as, as Thomas Hobbes would say it, you know, people being brutish and, and just trying to, you know, take things from each other and constantly at war. Um, he, he lived in um, England during the Civil Wars, I believe in the 1500s, could have been 1600s, but um, that if you have government, people tend to function better as a, as a society. So it's a social contract theory. Now, this has been pushed. I mean, after 9-11, the Patriot Act was part of social contract theory, meaning that we will give up, okay, you know, rights to privacy um, as far as phone calls, email, banking accounts, banking transactions, that when we go to airports, you know, we'll take our shoes off and all of these things. Um, that that is the exchange for not having another 9-11. Okay, that, that's, that is the trade right there that we're making with our with government, with social contract theory, saying we're going to give this to you. Not every, not, I'm saying <laughs> not necessarily that everyone is complicit in this, but this is the overall act of the social contract exchange that happened with the Patriot Act of saying this will go in place and... By most, you know, means we 
we'll be able to prevent a replication of 9-11. So, and I mean, which largely has happened for 17 years. We, we never hear about what's been prevented by the Patriot Act. And not that I'm championing the Patriot Act or things like that, but we, we don't ever hear of what really has been prevented by the surveillance community as far as attacks on the United States or global attacks. Um, we hear only about the things that the bad things that do manifest and happen. And, and we don't have a percentage of what is that compared to what was prevented. So I just want to say, I, I think that's something we have to be cognizant of. Um, so let's talk about the, the Tenth Amendment. And I'm going to bring this up. I'm going to change this and kind of lost my voice. So yesterday I was up at four in the morning and I taught a graduate uh, class in contemporary issues, I believe, and legal issues. Um, I'm sure that's not exactly the name of it, but it's basically a law class for aspiring superintendents. Um, All right. I got a quieter keyboard, so ah, here we go. Okay, got what I need. So yeah, anyway, yesterday I'm, I'm up by like four o'clock because I have to get ready for class and I, I'm instructing the class and I have to drive like two hours to get to the class. <laughs> so it's a, it's a private university and it's, it's fascinating um, from the aspect of they still have chalkboards. <laughs> it's very well maintained and, and it's actually... Uh, fun to teach in that environment where the technology was there. I mean, of course, they have projectors and things like that, but it was pretty much old school. I'm using chalkboard and I'm using paper handouts. Um, and sometimes I think it's better to, especially when you're teaching superintendents where they're inundated with technology all of the time and getting emails and whatever, to just back it off and and go a little bit more organic in how you're teaching. Like, I don't need to show you another PowerPoint because you're going to see 10 PowerPoints this week. So um, kind of a funny thing. And I took pictures when I would, I'd write on the board and get to different, you know, fill up the board before I erase it. I would take photos. I have an app cam scanner. It's free. And it gives you like a high res photo. And students would get up and take photos too. And I said, yeah, you can do that if you want. But like, I'm taking a photo and then I'll post it. Like there's a class site everybody can log into. And I'm like, I'll put it here. Um but it is it is amazing. Um, I, I abbreviated methods because I got to a a crack where the two sections of, of chalkboard come together, and I didn't want to write over it. And um, one of the students at one point said, um, I, "I think the the heading I wrote was priority was going to be prioritization methods, and I wrote prioritization meth." And he asked, um, and, and it's kind of funny because, I mean, with my age, you know, probably out of the, the 13 students in the class, maybe four are my age or older and the rest are younger. So um, it, this, was, this was a younger, you know, in his 30s. And, and he said, what's the, you didn't quite get to the point here on what is prioritization meth, like Meth, methadone, or meth, meth is this like part of something like with with the drugs and with the law and how we I'm like no 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 I'm like okay I can totally see and everyone kind of laughed I'm like I can totally see like what you that's what it looks like yes <laughs> it was supposed to be methods I had to kind of stop it and try to abbreviate it in this but um, no I'm like that's prioritization methods there's actually a process we go through and comparing one item to another. Is it more important? Is it equal or is it less important? And then that's how we determine priorities. It's one way you can do it. I said, we'll actually go through that in a later class. Um, it's a great tool, but uh, but yeah, we're not going to be talking about meth. So <laughs> I think I have a picture of it, though. I'm like, oh, my goodness. It's just crazy. But it's been a long, t- long time since I used chalk. It was a good chalk, though. It had very little dust. Um, even when I clean the board off and stuff like that. The erasers were all like completely clean and stuff like that. It's, 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 again, it was a, it's remarkable to teach in these old 
um, well-built, well-maintained, you know, like 100-year-old university buildings um, because just the, the architecture around, you know, like the doorways and, and the woodwork and stuff like that, it's just, it's, it's really a treat. Uh, but I was tired. So yeah, yesterday I got up at four in the morning and by the time I got home, it was past seven because, you know, I stayed and I answered some questions from, some, from class, you know, students. But at some point I'm like, you know, we all have to get going and, and I'm glad to Skype with you at night or something like that, you know, but it's been a long day and I'm not feeling a hundred percent. And I had to like keep drinking water and water and water and water, not to lose my, not to lose my voice. But, um, but yeah, that was really, really fun to do. I've taught, um, you know, several university courses since 2002. And this was the first time I had jumped up into teaching a law course. Um, but you know, very comfortable. I had a, had a great time doing it and, um, we've, meet again in a few weeks so (laughs) another long another long day so with caffeine and every everything i can do to to fight off you know i'm thinking gosh when i was like 20 25 like i would have handled that fine but it's like yeah get home um you know spend a little time uh with with the kids grab something to eat and like go to bed (laughs) i was like tired Wiped out, tired. So, Tenth Amendment. So, let's talk Tenth Amendment. Why? Why do we have these rescues? Why are they permitted to to happen? Um, the Tenth Amendment says the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, or reserved to the states respectively, or to the people. So, basically, okay. Basically, the Tenth Amendment is saying that if it hasn't been something that has been restricted by the federal government government or the state government, it, it flows through and it becomes a right of the people. So the right of the people to organize and to rescue others. So the Tenth Amendment is, is very strong in why we had the harbor rescue of 9-11 and also why we didn't have this plethora of lawsuits afterwards, frivolous lawsuits against, you know, duck boat captains or people feeling um, you know, they bruised their knee getting on a boat or something like that. That stuff didn't exist. And it didn't exist also after the Hurricane Harvey, Hurricane Irma rescues where Cajun Navy relief played a big part. Um, I interviewed someone who was going down to San Antonio shortly after the flooding that was occurring um, in the Houston area and Cajun Navy relief was responding. And this person talked about how the... Um, state patrol and local police cleared off one side of the interstate and then also put up signs, you know, those digital signs saying this lane for rescue vehicles and boats. Um, and, and she said that literally it was hours of these pickup trucks, pulling boats, fishing boats, pontoon boats, fan boats. Um, and that was Cajun Navy relief or similar groups civilian groups that were going down at that time to Houston to help out. So, um, and she said the applause, you know, it was just a nonstop applause from people um, in their cars as, 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 you know, this rescue force is driving past. So, but you're not going to read a lot about this approval um, or this happening from the state patrol or from FEMA or local police that they had cleared off these roads. I mean, there's video evidence of that because no one wants to take liability of what happens, again, if, if again, there's this rescue force ends up um, running over a power line when they're doing a rescue or there's some, you know, accident or, or whatever it could be. But, um There have been a few movements to try to regulate these groups, and those have quickly been, like, wiped away off of the legislative um, platform. I mean, so the civilian opinion on this is we need to have these type of rescue forces, and we support these. And the the state and local positions are also we need to support these, and FEMA um, passively is and implicitly is, is supporting these. So... There isn't yet something out there that says um, we will, as a government, um, absolve, I guess. Let's say that there there was something where a, one of these rescue 
you know, activities went sour and some people ended up perishing. Um, and then it was litigation, you know, that there isn't yet to my knowledge, some piece of, of legislation out there saying like, if this was, you know, acting in good faith during an emergency situation, um, that they are absolved, um, you know, unless it was something of gross negligence, um, but that they are absolved if something does happen. I, I, I don't I don't think we're far away from that, though. I think something like that will come out because if we don't have these type of organizations, their ability to come in and to scale and to provide the resources and, and the manpower, uh, we're not going to have these rescues flat out. Locally, locally, the Wisconsin Dells Ducks. So you can look that up. You might be familiar with it, duck boats. Unfortunately, there was that one duck boat that that um, that sunk. Um, I believe that was in, in Arkansas during a storm. Um, but there are rescue um, th- these ducks. The owner of the, the company. So the, not, this isn't far from where I live, like twenty minutes away. Um, dispatched some of these ducks. So they're amphibious. They they were designed to be used in World War II, so they could go on land and go in water. Um, and you know, you can Google, get an image of, understand what I'm talking about here, but you've probably seen them. They're in Boston Harbor, a lot of tourist type things. But So these are the authentic military ducks. And so the owner of the company took the ducks or some of the ducks over to these flooded communities um, nearby and then was able to, to use these to go in and, and help people recover things from their homes and, and get back out. So that is a private company and I'm not sure, again, what does that look like from an insurance perspective? If you're doing that privately, what do you take on for liability? But it is being um, approved uh, by local fire and you know uh, police, local response, because they don't have that type of equipment. And, if, and if you have to have not only the equipment, but you have to have the Ta- the the um, institutional knowledge of how to use that equipment. Like, you know, these ducks have been in, in Wisconsin Dells for like 50 years or more. So the experienced duck captains coming out with these things, like they know the duck, they know how to function the duck. There was something like during World War II where one of the ducks got stranded and um, the Germans looked at it and were trying to figure out how to use it. And there's all these things like buttons that will inflate the tires, deflate the tires, stuff like that. And of course, you had to memorize it. It wasn't it wasn't marked. Um, and it got to the point where they couldn't figure it out and they just like left it. <laughs> so, but you have the use of these specialized machines to go in to do a rescue. And so we have this interface of private with public during a disaster situation, during a declared disaster situation. Um, but so what is this what does this look like? And I think this is this is a debate that needs to be formally um, had at a state level and at county levels on what will you accept and interface with when it comes to a sentinel event like you know a hundred year flooding and something like that one of the frustrations with hurricane florence that i was able to track through twitter and i was getting contacted a lot because i had done uh, two podcasts last year with preston rice on the use of drones he's a commercial drone operator in rescue situations there, there were people coming with drones commercial drone operators wanting to help during hurricane florence and they were not one they weren't finding where they could interface with and two that they were just being turned away and i think part of that is um that was an issue where that was too fluid yet i mean um you you can't i mean surveillance yes you know like that that makes sense but you still have the storms ongoing so it's like you can't have people go into storms even like cajun navy you know, relief has to monitor when, you know, when the storm is in full storm mode, I mean, it's not safe for anyone to go into it. So I think it was a a part where that interface was a little too early, but it is a problem right now um, of not understanding how to use drones to quickly get in once the storm 
moves beyond. Once the hurricane force, you know, has been degraded and, and out of the area, to get surveillance at least. Um, and you can, I mean, you're going to get to the point quickly where you'll be able to use drones not only for surveillance, but to bring in supplies uh, in, into these areas. But yeah, to see what, what roads are accessible, what roads aren't accessible. I mean, again, you can do some of this by helicopter, some of this by plane, but with drones through coordinated software, which doesn't quite exist out there yet, um, it's being developed and it will be probably commercially ready before too, too long, um, where you'd be able to have a number of drones that could you know, all be deployed to one area and then they could each basically search a quadrant and then you could have this composite map of what was searched. That's close to happening with interfacing with different drones. Basically, be like you'd have the same app that you'd have to have. Um, So like this drone would do this area, boom, it would go into like this larger map. It'd be like putting a puzzle together. Like here's the puzzle piece for here. Here's the puzzle piece. Every drone is going to have different capabilities too, of like the resolution of the camera. Do they have the um, infrared capability and stuff like that? But it's something we're moving into, moving very rapidly. So it is something too of where will this interface work? And I bring this up to school administrators, and I'm going to bring this up as a case study in um, this class that I'm teaching right now of saying, you know, case study, okay, a um, second grade boy with, with autism has wandered from the uh, playground. And so the school has contacted authorities and they're, you know, they, they've responded. There's more authorities responding. You know, um, the principal has, noti- has had certain teachers out, you know, looking. And, um, but suddenly you have, you're approached by a neighbor and a neighbor says, listen, I have this commercial drone. It has infrared, and I want to participate in the search where, you know, where was a student last seen? So the question will be, one is, it's really probably not the principal or superintendent that's going to be making that call. It's that person quickly saying, okay, I'm going to get you to the instant command director, which is probably the chief of police or whoever's there like at that moment like i'm going to have this develop really quickly and um then or i mean it could be the principal we'll see how this plays out um but i want to get it from the superintendent perspective of is this something if where would they feel comfortable with with their principal making this decision or let's say even the superintendent was on scene it's a k-12 building and superintendent's there maybe that's how i'll frame it but um but anyway are you going to accept this help that this person is going to go out and so, you know, you probably would, like it would make sense too, but you're also, you know, now having this, you know, you, you, you don't know the background of this person. You don't know what's been searched, what hasn't. Um, is this drone going to frighten this, this student? I mean, there's this whole profile that you go through for missing persons when you do a search. And like, for example, persons with dementia are very linear, like they will climb over fences and it's basically a straight line. There have been multiple studies. So it's, it's something, if it's a student with autism, they're attracted typically in multiple studies, either to water or to machinery and might be hiding like in machinery and a baler or something that's out on a farm field, stuff like that. But is, is this going to... Uh, make things better or make things worse? Is it going to interfere if you've already searched an area, if dogs come on the scene, um, if there are other drones in the area that police bring in? Um, I mean, these are just considerations. So at some point you have to make a decision. (laughs) You have to make a decision fast and you have to stand by that decision. And I want to get people in the mode of thinking too that some of this, again, this is something I would see as being backed by the 10th amendment and you're acting in the best interest of the student. So if it were me, I'd be like, yeah, you have this resource. If you think that you can help us, here's a description of this child, get that thing up there and fly it out because we know it's only been so much time that the likelihood is a child isn't going to have gone very far. Um, but you'll have people that will be hesitant on that. Like, well, we don't know this person. This isn't an official, you know, rescuer. For, with an agency. So 
do we not interface with them? Um, and I've seen that too. Like I have completely seen that. So you're going to see both sides of this where discretion comes in and then also like where you have to make the decision as, as the leader in this or whether you're the instant command person. Just say, this is the decision I'm making. This is the Lloyd decision on 9-11, not sitting, twiddling his thumbs. He's saying, listen, gets on Marine Radio. He wasn't there at the time. He wasn't a meeting. It was patched through, but knew of what was happening. Gets, knows, you know, if there's going to be a rescue, it has to be everybody. Everybody that has a boat that can get in there has different levels of knowledge of the harbor and that people will figure things out. People have this tacit knowledge. They understand systems do develop. That's something, too, that we, we, we do not recognize that systems develop. Um, and then they, as soon as the need for the system has gone, <laughs> the system um, fades away, like on September 9th. We have the boat rescue for nine hours, transporting 500,000 people. People then are off of lower Manhattan. The boats go back to what they need to be doing. So um, it's those types of discussions, though, that are going to be critical to safety because things have changed. Things have changed. In 2011, that was the benchmark for the change in rescue happening um, where people would dial 911 and, and more or less expect fire and ex- ex- expect FEMA and things like that to, to really going like tribal with the phone. Like I am going to go to my phone and I am going to go to Facebook Messenger and I'm going to go to other apps. And we know the app Zello, it was in 2017, Zello existed. That was an app that was um, used um, much for dispatching uh, boats for rescue with the Cajun Navy relief. But people are going to be going to their phones and you have to embrace that. And we have right now, we have, but the thing is... It's mixed. Like you have school districts that have systems where students can can access the online system through their phone to report a threat or a concern. It can be a threat of harm to self or others. So so here's here's the deal, all right, with the phone. What if so you have school systems where you want students to report threats and you also have some systems that give messages back out to students saying, Listen, school's in lockdown because maybe the student isn't on campus right now, or maybe they're out on the football field, um, or maybe they're at an appointment coming back. Maybe they're at a two-year college. Um, You know, maybe that's going on. So you have these different, here we go. Okay. Just checking out some different apps. You have those different things going on. So, but then you have schools that say, they have policies that say all phones have to be kept in a lock box uh, during school or, or during classes. And one of the superintendents in this class that I taught yesterday said his school had spent $24,000 on a lockbox that students had to put their phones in. Twenty This year, $24,000 on this lockbox, which I'm going to try to bring up over here. Um, so... I don't know. Maybe this is it. Uh, no, this isn't coming. Oh, yeah, it is. Okay. Okay, here we go. No, I don't want to buy that. No. Well, whatever. Okay, anyway, I thought I thought I could locate the company. I could. It, but anyway, this company is selling this product, and I'm thinking you could do the same thing with a couple of shoeboxes or... Um, I mean, it just seems absolutely ridiculous, but apparently it has then the special box or container does not allow the signal to go through. So if someone calls the phone, the phone's not going to ring. But then like, so imagine if you're a district though, and you have part of your threat reporting is this online system. And now you've taken that away from kids and also the online notification, you've just deteriorated your threat input and threat notification system. So that doesn't make any sense to me. Like if you can't have it both ways. Um, And also I I think it's, I I think you need to work more in education because I mean, if kids are going to use phones, I I mean, everybody uses phones for everything. Like I use it for maps, um, use it for research. And 
we need to then just, this is part of everyday life going forward forever, just like the calculator was. Uh, and to sit there and ban that out of school saying it's too much of a, of a distraction. I don't, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. I think it still needs to be accessible and then incorporate it. I've, I took a class um, to demonstrate how to use phones as instructional tools, and it was fascinating, like how to use it, like to um, respond to different choices that were put up, how to use it to research things, like in the moment. It was probably one of the most engaged professional sessions as an adult that I've been in in years. And the facilitator was saying, yeah, I mean, it's a device. It's something that um, you, you, we can use it as a tool for instruction. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not a fan at all of these bands of phones from, from schools. I, I, think it, it's a, I think it's a bad move. I'm just saying that right now. So um, just wrapping up here on the Safety Doc podcast. So want to give a shout out um, to a few other uh, podcasts, the Clary podcast uh, with Aaron Clary, and then also Older Brother podcast. I've been on the panel a few times. Um, but list, I've listened to a few of Aaron's um, podcasts of, of recent. He's been out in the Rapid City area, bought a property out there. That's his intent to to move into the you know Rapid City. And Aaron does a lot of hiking. But he, he did a few podcasts. So again, you can check out uh, Clary podcast, Aaron Clary, A-A-R-O-N-C-L. A-R-E-Y, just type that in or captaincapitalism.blogspot.com, but you'll find it. Um, and he's he's hiking. And I don't know what he's using to record, if it's like his phone or some other type of device, but he's actually like hiking while he's doing a podcast. And the sound quality is remarkable. And you'd think, you know, you'd be distracted by the steps and other things. And no, not at all. The quality is is, is terrific. Actually, I think it's better than some of the, the studio type recordings. Um, but he really is, he, he's offering a great philosophy kind of at his stage in life. We're, we're the same age of, um, getting to the point of, you know, surrounding himself with nature where he can be out on his hikes and he has a fascinating, <laughs> it's a fun story. He also has a place in Las Vegas and his, his never ending battle with the scorpions and using boric acid to build a perimeter around his property and then push it out a little further and push it out a little further and then maintaining that. Um, it, it, it's, it's funny. It's entertaining. I was actually listening to that during my super long drive yesterday back and forth from, from the university. Um, but check, check that out because I, I think definitely, um, if you're looking for perspective of work-life balance. You know, Aaron has, had left the rat race a few years ago, but but now is transitioning more into the appreciation of, of I would say, pre-retirement. And um, if you're interested at all in hiking and connecting up with nature, just, just check out these and the stories. It's amazing. So Aaron Clary, Captain Capitalism, and check out... Um, also, Older Brother Podcast. That is live uh, most Tuesday nights, 6 p.m. Central, a panel just on different contemporary issues. Um, and you can post questions in a chat, and, and they can they respond it to. A shout-out to TJ Martinell and the Mountain Pass Podcast. TJ Martinell has really found his groove. So he has done about 20 podcasts now. And he's a writer, actually, for the Tenth Amendment Center lives in the Pacific Northwest and talks about um, his perspectives on the Tenth Amendment, but also talks about these these really <laughs> fun, earthy stories about taking his, his neighbor's seven-year-old dog with him on, on hiking excursions and, you know, walking into town instead of taking his, his car and just, you know, making his own, you know, furniture. And, and he lives in a cabin and how his... his um, the artwork, these are photos he's taken in, in the mountains, and that's what he's, you know, surrounding himself with. Also, I um, want to give a shout out to uh, Hector Solis and the Awareness Podcast. Uh, Hector released um, Mallory Grossman, part one and two of bullying. Mallory Grossman, 12 years old, had taken her life um, after persistent bullying. Hector did an interview with Mallory's mother, 
Yeah, very, um, very moving interview, but very practical in like, here's approaches that we can use as parents, we can also use as schools and communities um, to address bullying and increase awareness of what's happening with our with our kids. Um, I strongly suggest that you listen to both parts. The first part is, is Hector doing um, research and talking about the different legislative pieces in New Jersey uh, regarding bullying. And the second part focuses more with the interview uh, with Mallory Grossen's mother, Diane. So um, Hector always delivers top quality um, journalism within his his podcast. So please check that out. Sustainable Living Podcast, Marianne West. Um, and that has uh, become really fun. Uh, she's done some interviews now with the Tiny House Movement and people who have talked about um, building a tiny house and the things that went right and the things that didn't go right. So you 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 imagine these homes of a you know 115 square feet, not very big, and what it, considerations of what a bathtub is and what a bathtub isn't and what windows when you put them in. Oh my goodness, like I designed it myself and the windows are too low. <laughs> so how do I fix that? And then also mold, like if you're not moving the air through enough. And if you build these things like in Minnesota to get the R rating or the insulation rating, if you want to use like the wall type insulation, the walls have to be like six to eight inches. So it gets really all these factors that go in of the pros. Um, and then also the drawbacks of even like personal space. Like what do you, what do you do when you really have like your couch and that's like for you and um, you know, your spouse and, and your, your kid and you know, your two cats or whatever. It's, it's, it, Interesting to, if you're into architecture, if you're into um, engineering, and if you're, you're, you're just into the curiosity of, of what it's like. And it gets at this whole thing of minimalism. Aaron does that in Captain Capitalism. TJ is a minimalist. Um, Marianne is a minimalist of how, how much do you really need in life? And then what do you do with things that have been generational that now you don't need anymore and they're going to, you know, you want to pass them on. And it's kind of, you know, you look at the, the, the flooding that's occurred, this massive flooding and all this devastation. I mean, people who have now will come back and like artifacts and things that they've had for years and generations, they're gone, they're ruined. So they're, you know, the, you don't have a decision. And, and sometimes I think you have to go through life and, and reach that point, especially as you get older, like into where I'm at right now, like we're preparing another huge garage sale, like just get rid of more things, more things. But it's like, what do you really want? You know, so I got rid of my sandals that gave up the ghost and my dress shoes. Well, I can replace my dress shoes. I can go to the pair that I used to have and they're still pretty good, shine them up. And I do have another pair of sandals, not the same, but there's a good brand of sandals and then um, I just need more time to kind of break them in. And again, um, yeah, I I am feeling better. Um, I've, I've had more nights in the last three, four weeks where I've gone to bed, it, literally at 6 p.m., than ever in my life. Like back time, you know, the last time I went to bed at six, six o'clock, you know, I was probably in kindergarten. So, um, it really takes a lot to, to bring back the energy in your body. Um, you know, after you've had a, a pretty significant illness and, and kind of some ongoing stuff now, like I'm uh, nothing to worry about for any of you listening, but, um, it's, it's like, you know, biking's done for the year. Like you just won't have the energy to bike again. I mean, that'll have to be built up and running's done for the year. And I mean, some of those things. And so it, it's, it's really weird. I mean, it's one of those things too, like you appreciate health and, and being healthy, um, probably most after you're not healthy and after you're kind of knocked out of the game for a while. So thank you so much for listening to the safety doc podcast and check out the 405 Media, John Grant, and the 405media.com for the League of Extraordinary Podcasters. You'll find Captain Capitalism there, Readily Random with Larry Roberts, just a terrific lineup. The 405media.com. Thank you, everybody. This is the Safety Doc. Stay safe and let's stop all of that flooding. This has been the Safety Doc Podcast with author, radio show host, and leading safety expert, Dr. David Perot. 
Remember to check back each week for the latest, best, and most bizarre practices in safety preparation and crisis response. You can find Dr. Perotin on Twitter at SafetyPhD. And remember, the truth will keep you safe.